Hello and welcome to Breaking Ground on iProperty Radio with myself, Carol Tallon, the show where we chat to industry experts to get a view on what's happening on the ground and to learn about new trends emerging within the construction industry. This show is brought to you in partnership with Place Engage, a data-driven platform for more successful public consultation and community engagement for your next development project. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by returning guest, Gary Connolly, founder of Host in Ireland. Gary, thank you so much for joining us today. Hello, Carol. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I, I love when we have the opportunity to talk to you because you are very good at helping me see but behind the headlines of data centres and data centres delivery in Ireland. But let's start for people who might not be familiar. Host in Ireland, what is it that you do? Excellent. And uh, I was delighted in your introduction there. You said experts. Wow. Well, I may not be an expert, but I certainly know a few. Um, and I think that's a great place to start because that is the essence of what Host in Ireland is or was 10 years ago. Um, when we got a diverse group, uh, well, it was only five then, of competitors. Um, and we basically said to ourselves, okay, what are the challenges for you personally? You probably don't know each other. You probably don't talk to each other. You probably don't share each other's woes and pains at a, you know, not at a secret sauce level, just at a, a level where you can say, you have that problem as well? I'm having that problem as well. And suddenly, you know, the old uh, 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 problem shared, suddenly you don't feel like you're as crazy as you thought you were. So that whole concept of just getting bring people together in a room is very dynamic. And uh, the energy that comes off people, I think we found that in COVID, didn't we? We, that, uh, <laughs> we had all these tools and yet we didn't quite get the same impact from a meeting with someone because they were pixelated. But uh, so that was the start really was to... to, to you know, help people um, get together within the industry. We come to 2024 today and we have 59 partners. Um, but what's different is, um, and this is key, is and maybe the name actually is, is something that puts people slightly away from what the core essence is of Host in Ireland. It's, it's as much now about the Irish as it is about Ireland. And why, what do I mean by that? If you look at sort of the data centers are only a part of a much, much wider digital infrastructure uh, industry. So uh, for those that may be not so familiar, it, it, you know, we could have called it uh, substation Ireland. And people would say substation Ireland. And then because we know more about electricity, we know, oh, substation is only a part. Then you have cables. Then you've got wall sockets, then you've got light bulbs, then you've got switches. So we have a better appreciation for electricity because we've lived it than maybe a data center. So what does it do? <laughs> so that's why as we've developed over the years, the cohorts have changed. The ecosystem has changed. So as we had initially say five who were the top of the apex, all of the other sub cohorts, the designers, the builders, the operators, the suppliers are part. So in 2024, very much different, say, to 2014. By the way, we're 10 years old today. Happy <laughs> um, birthday. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we're having a cake tonight. It's wonderful. Um, is that it's a community of Irish in Ireland, from Ireland, both multinational and local indigenous Irish companies. And now we find ourselves, for instance, as an example, within the next month, I'm in London, Copenhagen, Frankfurt, North Virginia. Um, and it's not necessarily, I mean, let's be honest, if you don't know, Ireland is in play as a location for foreign direct investment and data and, and the centres. Uh, if you don't know that, then you've been living under a rock for the last 15 years. But what's less understood is the people, the companies, the Irish or international companies that are headquartered here who have learned building wafer fabrication units for Intel or building Pfizer and pharmaceutical, the skills that they have learned in advance even of something like a data center being invented were there, the core skills were there. And this is our time now to aggregate all of this 50 years of foreign direct investment learning with these companies, with those skills, and now, Carl, it's I'm of a certain age where I never thought I'd go into a 
at an event in, in Amsterdam and literally pinch myself looking at the Irish are being pitched to way more than the Irish are pitching to. It's just one of those moments where you go, wow. And there's not a single person, thank God, in our gang that that use words like, ah, sure, we're punching above our weight, aren't we? We'll be grand. Nonsense. Yeah. We're exactly where we deserve to be. And yeah. again, you know, the, the analogy I often use is that to half time, we're, we're out there playing rugby and uh, we're beating the All Blacks. Your man Farrell doesn't go in at half time and say, well done, lads. It's our punching above your weight. <laughs> <way." Yeah. laughs> uh, you're absolutely right. And actually, I, I think really what you're epitomizing there is the, the expertise that you're pulling together. And, you know, it's amazing uh, what we've seen across construction over the last uh, 15 years, particularly, was that move away from uh, cycles of of. Uh, positive and uh, uh, oh, oh, good times and, and not so good times where we saw construction expertise emigrate to uh, now we're in a position where we're exporting, um, uh, you know, our, our construction expertise. And, you know, you touched on FDI. That is that has been so huge and so transformative in Ireland over the past 50 years. But over the last 10 years, I think there have been question marks about our policy and is it moving in the right direction? And sometimes uh, within Ireland, there can be a little bit of navel gazing and not understanding our place in capital markets around the world. So given that you are traveling internationally, objectively, what is the reputation outside of Ireland around FDI, given maybe some of the political um, and some of the policy changes that we've seen over the past decade? There's many questions in there. I guess uh, we'd start off first by saying that the Danish uh, the Nordic, Spain, Portugal, Greece, places like that, they see Ireland right now as their greatest salespeople because we seem to be rejecting a lot of data center um, projects. Therefore, they're not going anywhere, so they're going to go to some other place. Um, the good news, as I said already, is that the, the Irish are actually building them. So we're actually um, uh, um, getting a dividend of foreign direct investment, what would be our, our, our reputation? Well, it still will be very strong. Why? Because it it, do, it takes a long time uh, to build pedigree in anything. Now, I'm not saying that it doesn't take a short time to lose it as well, um, but still, you, you have to be mindful that we are still in a full employment situation in Ireland. We're unlikely to hit a recession. All these things being equal. Um, I like what you said there, um and if you're correctly navel gazing today is not the time to be celebrating today is the time to be planning because when you look at and i went for a walk around a reservoir recently you know there was massive objections to the reservoirs and in, in and around dublin because they had to flood dams and stuff they had to flood lakes and blessington etc but actually it was needed why they needed to take that proactive view because our Dublin, in case this case, population was growing. People didn't want their children dying of, of, of common diseases, all that type of stuff. It took someone very strong to go and make the conviction to go and say, we need to dam Blessington Lake for the growth in Dublin. Yeah. And it happened. Mm -hmm. And now if you told somebody now that in, in the 50s, there were uh, objections on the roads to uh, all that happening, and even closer, and this I'll, I'll come on to the data center stuff. Even closer, if you recall the uh, the national roads in Ireland being um, upgraded with the European Social Fund money, um, again there were such objections. Just fundamental: we don't need them, we don't want them, we can't have them. And now in 2024, I live uh, here in Wicklow. If you told someone that we were taking the N11 away, they'd say, "Well, how am I getting to Wexford in?" 40 minutes and how do I get in and out of our club in 15 minutes and how do I how do I how do I so change is not easy change is hard but change needs planning and change needs people that sit down from both sides of the equation and um, the entrepreneurs who are more on our side should always be ahead of policy that's just the way of things otherwise we'd still probably be cracking rocks in in a cave somewhere you know, so at some stage, some lad got out and said, eh, I want my own cave. Eh, 
I want my own land. I want, you know, that in it that has yeah. to drive and drive and drive. Ireland has still a very strong reputation. But I'd also say to you, and, and let's not forget this, the Irish have a wonderful reputation. I don't know if I'm allowed to say it on, on, on your show, but they get shit done. Yeah. Okay. It's a technical term that we carry in our portfolio. <laughs> you won't learn it in Harvard. However, when we look at why the Irish are designing, building, and the most sought after groups in Europe, in EMEA, in NIA, and even as far as Asia, it's because of that we get stuff done. Yeah. We get stuff done. So then you ask, okay, that's great, but why can you not get stuff done in Ireland then? And then we start to look at, okay, well, if we're getting stuff done outside of Ireland at rates that really we've never experienced as an Irish group before, um, and the hunger, and to your point earlier, the hunger associated with seeing this 66 billion in digital infrastructure in Europe, 66 billion between now and 2028 opportunity, means that a lot of companies that were um, subject to the the cork on the wave in Ireland and just being in Ireland that goes up and down and up mm. and down and up and down. Now they can spread the risk. Yeah. And they can basically say, well, all these skills we have are the same skills that are needed. So let's not be afraid to bring and transpose those skills somewhere else, but not be subjected to, let's be honest, two massive dips in the last short yeah. term. Um, and, and therefore, that's why you start to see the hunger, the passion, the skills all over Europe. Ireland itself, um, you know, I, I, I select words carefully sometimes. And what I'd like to say about sort of the current challenges of Ireland and data centers is we are actually challenged by our own success. Can you explain that? Because I, I look, I, I think you position it well when you say entrepreneurs need to be ahead of policy. And, you know, I, I think that we say, oh, we, we talk about the resilience of the industry all the time. Whereas actually, I don't believe that an industry should have to be resilient against bad policy. And I think that's what's happened at the moment. So I think, you know, essentially being victims of our success just sounds very Irish. So can you explain what you okay, mean so, in this context? OK, so. Thank you for, for asking those direct questions because it's important. So why do we have so many data centers in Ireland? That's probably a good place to start. Mm -hmm. we, we have so many data centers in Ireland because guess what? We were the center of the universe for software in the 90s. We were the number one exporter globally of software on floppy disks. Before that, we were the number one export of mainframes assembled by Amdahl and IBM on hard disks. So it's a, just a, a simple evolution of the companies that established in Ireland, whether they were mainframes that became software developers, software development companies that became cloud-based companies. And if, if you ask all your listeners, one thing to take away from this talk is the cloud is a data center. If you teach that to anybody, that's way past 99% of people. They yeah. say, I love the cloud. It's so flexible. I have all my apps, but I really don't like data centers. It's the same thing. It's like saying I love, I hate electricity. I, I, I love electricity, but I hate substations. The same analogy. Th so, that, was, that was the conversation that happened right through COVID. And the irony of politicians resisting uh, data centers was the fact yeah. that they were doing it via Zoom and Teams and, and communicating yeah. this via Twitter with no understanding yeah. of how yeah. that was happening. You're right. And I think if we get, we're at that level with people that we've lost the battle already, if that makes sense, I think really what then we have to look at is, OK, we get the fact, most people get the fact that digitalization and decarbonization are the two of the largest global megatrends right now. And where do those two global megatrends meet in, in a very tangible way is the data center. Mm. And they're not easy. Digitalization is not easy in its own right. Decarbonization isn't right in its own right. But let's just go back one second. So that's how we find ourselves right now. Um, since around about 2010, as everybody stopped using floppy disks and as the internet and the infrastructure started to grow, we were the first, we were always given first refusal on these new innovation. Mm -hmm. First refusal on floppy disks, first refusal on tar disks, first refusal on, on the cloud. 
So most of the Microsofts and these people that we now commonly use on their apps, stores and stuff, they would have used Ireland as their base. Why? Because the people running these organizations had knowledge of Ireland. If you can localize software in 52 languages, put it onto floppy disks and put it onto you know, manuals with Donnelly documentation, you can build a data center. You understand the principles of what we're doing. That's why I have a floppy disk always in my pocket. Because more people understand that and lean into that than the cloud or data centers. Gary, that, hold on to it. That that antique could be worth something to you. Someday. Well, it might be. It might be. I might even have software on it. But so that so that's how we be, had ourselves in this situation where people said, "Okay, well, the next iteration of a CD-ROM is a, a data center." You guys in Ireland have been working with us for thirty-five years. Would you like to give this a crack? Well, the lads had already gone to America and all, already started <laughs> to learn about it because people don't want to be out of work. And if the best way to not be out of work is to be part of the solution that's coming down your tracks, not resist what you're doing right now. So it also coincided, let's be blunt, it also coincided with one of the worst crashes in construction history in this country, 2008 to 2012, right? So the, the, the really good companies, the really companies that believe, look, we've got all the infrastructure, why don't we change our mindset and start be inward and outward looking, follow the projects. So now we arrive in 2024, as I said, numerous times where Lula, Frankfurt, London, Amsterdam, Berlin, Athens, it's like Blanchestown. <laughs> it's like Blanchestown. There are the, the, there is so many of the skills, not just the construction side, the subsupply side, and yeah. you go to factories up in in in, in the likes of Anord and these people, they have four to five years of packed order books as we move to a different phase of digital infrastructure where we're modularizing stuff, which is something close to your heart, where we're actually now starting to see, oh, I wonder what a Lego style approach work. And guess where we're doing a lot of the Lego style approach? Here in Ireland and exporting. Mm -hmm. So I think that really where we have, and this is the challenge of success is that because we were at the, the innovation side, let's call that the data, let's call that the data side. The data side, we've got an explosion post-COVID and, and an even worse explosion now that AI has become sort of the common language in, in, in everybody's world and work. Um, and the demand in the world for data and there is the number one thing. Mm -hmm. The rain needs to be kept off it. So you need a center. Ireland was the first mover. We didn't equally plan. So we were very good on the innovation side. We've got all of the pedigree. We've got all of the people that can do it. But the parallel of, oh, we're going to need more electrons or electricity. They didn't keep up. Because one, one thing and another, really, we didn't build out the infrastructure 10 years ago to support what we've got now. Yeah. So because we don't have that, the unknown was AI. And because AI has come, that's putting pressure on everybody, yeah, every yeah. location. And it will be really, really fair to say, um, and you know, we can start picking different departments in Ireland, that everywhere that is calling themselves a, a tier one location for hosting is having massive challenges with the supply of electrons. That's not the issue. The issue right now is that all the other places seem to have a clear plan. We don't. So in so, terms of Ireland's um, um, capital projects that are planned now across infrastructure that are wheeled out by government um, in a very celebratory way, you know, you made the point very well that entrepreneurs are always ahead of policy and, and that's the way of the world and that's as it should be however policy limitations uh can't hinder that growth which is absolutely happening at the moment it's why your members are you know obviously they would want to be delivering outside of ireland as well but i'm quite sure they'd like to be delivering more projects in ireland um it, it's more than just not planning we're allowing ourselves to be derailed uh, maybe in populist ways. And I think it's interesting coming into the political year that we're coming into. It feels like we need some real, not just political bravery, 
But we need some really clear communication and the industry has to do a certain amount of this itself because yeah. uh, we're very good at speaking to each other and we're not as good as uh, at educating and bringing the general the, the general electorate along with us. And the general electorate are the people who are feeding into their local politicians right now, this week, this evening on their doorsteps. Yeah, yeah and there's two things to, to pick up on. I joke about it regularly, but um, not too long ago, I was, I was actually told by a policymaker, look, one of the reasons we're not overly getting on board this whole data center story and, and all the rest is because very soon we understand it will be replaced by the cloud. Now, we might laugh and smile and we might have all that, but that's very real. Yeah, That's a very real challenge because your listeners may or may not, and I'll reiterate, know that a, the cloud is a data center. You know, uh, David Attenborough recently joined Instagram and had the first number one of any day, two and a half million uh, people. Effectively, David, the headline was David Attenborough joins Instagram to save the planet. Now, let's take out Instagram and put David Attenborough joins a data center to save the planet. It's a very different view of it. And everybody, it's become like a great white shark, the word. I come from an era when 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 Jaws came out. After that, everyone, you know, you've more chance of actually being hit by a flying bus, not just a bus, than yeah. a great white shark. But the fear that it brought on us is just emotional yeah. because I, that, I can feel it now as you're saying. Nah, there, there, but, there, but there you go. It's yeah. the same emotional thing that data center. Oh, yeah. 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 But then you throw in even to people that are, are very anti. Well, cloud. Oh, I love the cloud. It's so flexible. It gives me all I want. I love the smart meter I have at home that's connected to the cloud and reduces my energy consumption in my house by 35%. So suddenly, you, you, you in my opinion, and I, I've expressed this at many events and stuff, about 22 years ago when IBM uh, were deciding what this connected world would be called, they actually said, well, we call it grid computing. Or will we call it the cloud? And the marketeers won out. Whereas actually, if we had to call it grid computing, I guess we may not have such bad press because people would know, oh, okay, well, it's a computer. Yeah. Whereas a lot of people uh, 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 don't quite connect. Data centers equal the cloud. So my sense on somewhere like Ireland is that uh, it's no better or no worse than any other geographic location in the challenges that we have. We're trying to build a innovation age of 2024 on infrastructure, that electrical infrastructure, that was in a different two-back industrial age. That's a big problem. It's like saying, okay, we want to have cars everywhere, but they have to run on the rail tracks. It's very different. You've got, you know, they didn't do that. They built the own roads. One of the things that we do have different in Ireland is we've so many departments, so many departments. So when you look at something like digitalization and decarbonization, you probably have five departments with different views from electricity to electricity distribution, mm -hmm. to the Department of Enterprise, to the Department of Housing, which is the planning, to the Department of, um, I'm sure there's about three or four that I've missed. Mm -hmm. Whereas what we see in other uh, geographic locations that are more focused on 2024 um uh, governance and, and and stuff is they have a minister specifically for digitalization, which includes the provision of data centers. Yeah. So basically, it's a different, it's it's a totally different view in it because at the moment what we have is we even within the different departments we've different views. Oh yeah, we can we have all this offshore uh, wind. We've nearly thirty seven gigawatts. We only need five ourselves. Let's export all that electricity. Why would we start to elect, export wholesale electricity to someone else for them to make something to sell it back to us and we can take it and make something in Ireland? And that's also for your listeners. Yeah. Go but, back. You know, the, but just to, to kind of pull, pick you up there on the points about the different departments, to be honest, I would say it's much more than five or six that it touches off. But actually, that's not a... That's not an insolvable problem. You know, so what we see, for example, um, is what we see across Europe, just to kind of draw an analogy there, there's this concept that's emerging called rural proofing. So essentially, 
while we have our Minister for Rural Affairs, actually there's a rural proofing uh, exercise that ought to be happening with every new policy that is implemented in Ireland, whereby there is, uh, there is uh, a department that is looking at this through the lens of rural. So actually, this is something that could be done where irrespective of the department, that actually we have a digital lens, understanding, as you rightly point out, that decarbonisation and digitalisation are the two mega trends um, of this generation, that actually if we were to look at all policies through the lens of both decarbonisation, which I feel is actually happening, but maybe what we're not doing is looking at it through the lens of digitalisation, and then you're not dealing with any one department, you're actually getting a holistic view that actually is required to be able to shape policy and to put policy um, issues in context so you're not pitting one department against another, which is and what's isn't happening. That isn't that true? And also, you know, a lot of these mega trends. Uh, if I was to say to you um, that we have been having these same discussions in, on and around Ireland for over 10 years now, mm -hmm. okay? um, what does that mean? It means that nothing gets done in infrastructure in one political cycle. What does that mean? You're going to get different ideologies popping in, unwinding all the previous policy to go and find a new policy. You know, something is as important as electricity had an all, an all, uh, it actually has an all island strategy, actually, including Northern Ireland. You had it planned well, you had it implemented well. The, the, you know, right now we're in the middle of this. It feels like a, a spinning dryer. We know we're going to get dry clothes, but it's going to be an awful lot of bumps on the head as you go along. Um, we also have, and again, I go back to the floppy disk, you know, um, data in centres is a big, big part of our largest export, service export from Ireland. ICT and related services. So because it's not tangible, it's very hard for people to see the value. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you go down to, say, a pharmaceutical plant and you see the trucks with the drugs and, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, we've a huge disproportionate amount of centers in Ireland to to our population. But we also make, what is it, five million Viagra pills a month somewhere? At that, I'm not sure whether that's, a view on Ireland, but we are we are a manufacturing port of entry for so many products from Asia and from the US that if we didn't have a disproportionate amount, then our FDI isn't working. Mm -hmm. You have a backdrop behind you, I think it's of the IFSC in Dublin. That's right. Huh? So that, yeah. okay, so imagine if we if 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 you didn't have all those people behind you looking at funds and blah, 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 for the whole world. Mm -hmm. You probably get all you need for Ireland in that little obelisk thing right at the yeah. top of your head there. Yeah. So yeah. we need to be mindful that we are a foreign direct investment, one of the leading foreign direct investment locations in Europe. We have been for 50 years. Data has been one of those pillars. We yeah. used to do it on hard disks and floppy disks and CDs. Now we do it on servers, and but it's tangible. It's worth 180 billion euros per year to the exchequer. It's our largest service export. You then have, you know, I often think, wouldn't it be great if we just painted outside all these data centers a floppy disk? People go, oh, that's they, what they, they'd understand it. No, I, I think that's a fair point. And look, I'm conscious of your time today. So I but I do have one question just uh, yeah. that, that, I, that I would like to put to you because I'm curious and I'm curious as to the sentiment of your members as well. And, you know, you touched on it there. Infrastructure delivery by its very nature is larger and therefore longer in duration than any political cycle. Now, uh, Cynic would say that that makes it very difficult in uncertain times to get things done. Now, knowing the political year that we're entering into, that there is likely to be um, some upheaval, how confident are you that what we have at the moment is a multi-party approach that actually any political change is not going to almost reset the clock or set us back in terms of infrastructure delivery? I think 
you probably, as well as I, as well as many of your listeners know that when you come into a, a end of term uh, period, um, irrespective of your uh, biases or party, everybody becomes populist. <laughs> so what you have is you've got a lot of stuff that is ready to be signed off, which will be signed off, but there'll be very little big debate or discussion that's going to be in any way knocking the the turkey off its perch. And therefore, unfortunately, a lot of the hard discussions will have to be kicked into the next administration. Mm -hmm. More concerning, I think, for us right now is that anything that's put in place in this administration, which could alter both getting electrons onto the grid and taking electrons off the grid, could take 10 years to unravel. Meanwhile, other locations appear to be able to be executing on plans, taking the projects that are earmarked for Ireland, integrating them into their own countries, even locations that have grid constraints. And therefore, you know, there was an old saying, um, I'm not sure whether it's appropriate for 2024, but never let another man buy your girlfriend a drink. <laughs> It's only going to end <laughs> badly, right? Gary, and, you have you have a wonderful way of putting things in context. And that is what we have unfortunately done when it comes to centers that hold data that have that have taught so many of our companies great disciplines to export those skills. And we must be mindful of something you said earlier. There was a time when when, in, when we joined the European Union in 1973, our two largest exports were live cattle and people, live people and live cattle. Foreign direct investment came along and Ireland of today is not solely based on that. Of course it's not, but it certainly was a big bedrock of people that worked for a multinational, then got inspired and set up their own company. And um, we are now running the risk, which is a, a different form of talent export that People are going to work in Netherlands. They're going to work in Denmark. They're going to work in the Nordics. They're going to Athens. They're going to Africa on projects, Irish-led projects for digital infrastructure. Quite a few of them are going to get married. Quite a few of them are going to have children. Quite a few of them are going to actually like lifestyles. Mm -hmm. So it's a, the irony is that because of our inactivity on, on doing our best to keep this amazing talent here, um, those that detract and say they don't create many jobs are actually indirectly helping to export any jobs yeah. that were. There. So yeah. I, I, I think it's when we chat and we join up thinking. But of course, we're not politicians. We're not populist people. Uh, therefore, when you look at it, when you look at it, don't give anyone else the opportunity to give our girlfriends or boyfriends <laughs> drink. <laughs> Gary, I, uh, well said, as only you can. And I suppose, look, finally, before we finish up today, I actually want to yeah. take the opportunity because, of course, we've gone we've gone uh, way off topic to what I today was really just about a simple chat to, to congratulate you and all of your 59 members and hosts in Ireland for yeah. a wonderful decade of raising awareness, um, of teaching people what the cloud is how it works and obviously we are doing this call by a video call we're recording it to the cloud so that i'm doing this from a hotel in galway my producer is either in galway or dublin today i'm on my way down the motorway to dublin hopefully to join you guys for cake tonight and yeah. in the meantime my producer will pick up on this share it with our digital marketing manager who god knows where he is in the world today and all of this will will go out and be hosted on social media, which is how people will find it. None of that will be possible without data centers. So thank you. You're welcome. I didn't do any of it myself, but I certainly know people who did. Well, look, if you provide the cake, that's a good start. <laughs> I got um, you. <laughs> so genuinely, congratulations to you and to all of your members at Host in Ireland. I think it's an amazing thing that you do and you probably don't get the credit for it. Um, but quite genuinely, there's there's a huge amount that we need to be grateful for. Um, so look, uh, my thanks as always, um, just not just for taking the time today as well to take us through some of the challenges. And I think actually uh, we didn't even touch on maybe some of the 
opportunities that data center brings in terms of investment in renewable projects. And that's something I'd definitely like to pick up the conversation with you another day. But for yeah. now, that's all we've time for. That was Gary Connolly, founder of Host in Ireland. And um, my thanks as always to show producer Katie Tallon and to the production team at Hear Me Roar Media. And also thanks to Place Engage for making these conversations possible. Um, and thank you indeed for tuning in. We'll catch you on the next episode of Breaking Ground. In the meantime, please be sure to check out all of our other Irish and international real estate and construction shows on iProperty Radio, made possible by data centres. <laughs>